Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by Arc. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by Arc or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by Arc to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of Arc Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, our weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. One of the biggest trends we're witnessing is the merging of technology and media. And no one understands this better than this week's guests, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Jared Geller, who co-founded HitRecord, an online platform for creators like artists, musicians, and writers to find each other and collaborate on projects. In this episode, we talk about what it's like for creative types to build technology platforms, the future of the media business, and Joe, tells us which of his movies we really ought to watch. I am James Wang, internet analyst at ARC, and I'm joined by my colleague, Nick Groose, who covers all things media and streaming. Well, thank you, Joe and Jared, for being here on FYI with us. First, just want to start off by asking and getting a sense and hearing you talk about HitRecord. So if you could introduce HitRecord, the platform you founded, Joe and Jared, that you've co-founded, that would be great. Well, first of all, thanks for having us. Yeah, so HitRecord is a community around creative collaboration. A lot of art and creativity online is people posting things they've made on their own and building up their own audience, which can be great, of course, but on Hit Record, it's less about, look at what I made, and it's more about what can we make together. So people start projects and find collaborators, and they make short films and music and writing and art. And it's a really wonderful feeling to connect with other people online, not just as a social chatting thing, but as a way to make something, be productive and do something that you might not have been able to pull off on your own. Mm -hmm. And I think this is Jared, when the premise is engaging in an activity online where you're looking for people to collaborate with, you're looking for co-conspirators versus looking to just get likes or a share or a retweet. What we have found, because we've been doing this now for over a decade, that premise yields a really positive environment because to be creative, you kind of have to be open. And what we've seen is the community that has formed with HitRecord it's a really positive space on the internet. And that's not us. That's just the premise of when people collaborate together, it just yields positive interactions. And when I think of Hit Record and the premise around the creative development process, I think there is a stark difference between what happens on Hit Record and social media platforms. Can you just expand a little bit on that difference and why Hit Record isn't a social media platform? Because it doesn't feel that way and it's not built to feel that way. Yeah, it's a funny thing. I always ask myself, what exactly does that mean, social media? It's come to me in a a very particular thing because certain successful business models have made a lot of money doing it, made money through this kind of attention economy and advertising combined with big data and you know, machine learning that can track you and (laughs) all that stuff. And that's what social media has come to mean. But a social network really just means lots of people all over the world connecting. And lots of people all over the world connecting doesn't have to mean that they're being funneled into this particular kind of advertising mass surveillance machine. A social network can mean something where people's purpose is to make things together, to be productive, to accomplish something they might not have been able to do on their own. And that's what we're building. And just to give a specific example, like when you open up our app, you don't land on a feed of content, you land on a feed of projects. And each one of those projects is an opportunity for you to get involved with other people. And someone started that project and they're looking for collaborators. And it could be someone who wrote a story and is looking for an illustrator. It could be someone who made a beat and is looking for a baseline. It could be someone who just has an idea and needs lots of different collaborators. It could be someone who just says, hey, I drew an elephant. Let's all draw elephants together. It could be really ambitious or really simple, but it's people who want to be creative together with other people. And that's a very different thing 
than people who have posted their content, whether it's a video or a snapshot or whatever, and the call to action is like me, follow me. It's very different than let's collaborate. Right. Your call to action is let's collaborate. When I think about analogizing to what exists in the world, people will often jump to Instagram and Facebook as maybe, oh, it's sort of like this. But really, the closest analogy is something more like GitHub, right? Yeah, GitHub, man. Yeah, we talk about GitHub a lot. (laughs) The way programmers work is a lot closer to the spirit of what you're trying to get into. Programmers have kind of figured this out a while ago because you need a team of people to create something reasonably complicated like Bitcoin. Right. And these are just people around the globe. They all have to work together, but they have to work on a common code base. So there needs to be version control and check in and online software that makes that happen. GitHub has become big because it lets multiple people work on the same project together. It sounds like Hit Record is doing that, but for creative projects. Absolutely. The open source movement is a big inspiration for how we have always thought of Hit Record. Like years ago, when Jared and I were first kind of conceiving of all this, one of our favorite thought leaders was the lawyer and writer Lawrence Lessig, who wrote a great book called Remix. Remix is all about how online creative culture has fostered this different approach to people building off of each other and collaborating in that way. But if you look earlier in Lawrence Lessig's catalog, he's writing about open source. I forget the title of one of his books, but it's exactly about the open source coding movement, the center of which is GitHub right now, or has been for a long time. And so you're absolutely right. What coders are doing, working together in an online environment, building off of each other, incorporating each other's libraries and functions and various blocks of code into their own project and sharing that creative process together. There's no reason that shouldn't work for art. And I think we've been proving that it does. And you know, now we're in the midst of figuring out how to make the whole process a lot more user-friendly and efficient and accessible so that it can work at scale. Just to build on what we're talking about, it's funny, Joe and I never considered ourselves tech people necessarily. We didn't want to call ourselves a tech company. Of course, when you connect hundreds of thousands of people around the world to collaborate through technology, you're a tech company. (laughs) But, you know, half of our team now are developers and they're awesome. And what's so cool is that it's a very similar kind of mindset, a developer as somebody who you might more traditionally call an artist It's this kind of abstract thinking. You kind of have to think in a very abstract way and envision how you want things to be and then translate it into another language. Like developers are literally speaking another language. And I've had conversations with our dev team and I'm realizing like some of the similar conversations as how I would speak, the conversations that I would have with an editor or a writer in talking about abstract ideas and trying to articulate that into a code or visuals or edit. It's very similar kinds of conversations. We actually do speak the same language. So it is funny that it is netting out is, oh, this is like a GitHub because we ultimately do speak the same kind of thinking language. What kind of metaphors from GitHub carry over to creative work, art, music, videos? Like, for example, can people fork repositories or content? Is the default permissions open for other people to use? And how does credit happen? Walk us through some of the finer details. Sure. Well, yeah, you mentioned credit. Attribution is a big thing for us, as is Remix. What gets called fork on GitHub, we tend to call Remix. Remix is just if you take something that someone else has done and you make it your own somehow. And that could be that you take a tiny little fragment and you incorporate it into your larger piece, or you take their larger piece and you just tweak it a bit and make a new version. All of the above is possible. But when you're constantly remixing each other, attribution is very, very important. You can't remix someone else's thing without giving them credit. That feels wrong. When you do give them credit, it feels so right. It feels great. Like getting remixed is actually, I find, an incredibly exhilarating experience as an artist, much more so than any other kind of feedback you can get. You know, you can get a round of applause, you can get a good review, you can do well at the box office, you can get awards, all of these kinds of feedback, you can get likes, you can get comments, all of these kinds of feedback you can get, they only go so far. Whereas when someone remixes you, that means that someone has cared enough about what you did, that it inspired them to be creative. And through their creativity, you can really see what they thought. You can really get a sense of how 
what you put out into the world made an impact on someone else. And sometimes it's really unexpected and fascinating to see what someone else made out of what you did. And anyway, so Remix is really crucial, like forking. And then the attribution, that's a big part of how our platform works. Whenever you contribute, we call it contribute, you could say upload a new piece of content. You're always prompted to list your resources. We call them resources, which is basically the things that you have remixed. And so every contribution on our site has a list of resources and remixes. Now, of course, some things don't have as many resources or some things have none and some things haven't been remixed yet, but everything has the potential to have its list of resources and remixes of where it came from and where it's headed. And that forms a family tree of attribution. That's really crucial for a bunch of reasons. One, it's crucial when you're kind of in the midst of a creative process and you're like looking through a project and you're seeing how you might want to get involved or where it's going, seeing what the resources are, what the remixes are is fascinating and inspiring and illuminating. It's also really important if and when any of the stuff ends up becoming a monetized production, its attribution becomes key because We've paid contributing artists in our community uh, over 3 million bucks over the years for different times that various things in our community have been monetized when we've made a TV show or we've made various branded content partnering with brands like LG or Sony or Samsung or Levi's or we've published books, we've put out records, we've done all kinds of things. And whenever any of those projects make money, we're currently, sorry, I'm just shouting out our current partners, Zappos and Ubisoft. Whenever any of those projects make money, it's really important that the community get paid. And so that attribution is necessary in order to make sure that everyone gets fairly paid. I think it's also important when you have all those individual ingredients, elements that make up a larger whole, In terms of community management and community vibes, if certain individuals or a group of individuals isn't liking the direction that a certain project leader is taking with their project, through the use of Remix, they can just make their own thing. They can go another direction completely. And the project leader on project A might think like, oh, wow, I didn't think of it that way. But it allows for an environment where it's an open sandbox. They can create whatever they want. It's not beholden necessarily. Yeah, projects do take leadership. But if you don't like the direction that that project's going, then start your own. Mm -hmm. Just taking a step back and thinking about how far Hit Record has come and where it still has to go, what stage would you say you're in in the long-term vision of what you want Hit Record to be? And then as you scale this, How do you balance the social features so you don't become too much like a traditional social media platform versus the creative development tools that you've been building out? Do you want to limit the timeline to like 20 years from now or 40 years from now? Five years? Because that's true. Jared is right. When you ask those questions, I start thinking (laughs) sci-fi. I have really optimistic and lofty ideas about what hit record could be. And Jared and I have always talked on that scale. And like you said, we've been doing this a long time. 10 years ago, we sat at a restaurant and made a list of things that we could try to do with this new idea for a production company. Back then, we thought of ourselves as a production company. And we made a list. We had just bought the book, The Singularity is Near by Ray Kurzweil. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that list, at that time, the community was very small vibrant and positive and in fact having a lot of the same spirit that it has today but it was much much smaller and was doing much smaller smaller things it was totally just a hobby this little thing this message board i was running with my brother and jared really came to me with the idea of like could this be something more ambitious could we tackle larger scale productions with this kind of collaborative creative process and we made a list of things that we would want to try to accomplish as a production company we one of the first things on the list was maybe this community could make a collaboratively made short film that was good enough to play at Sundance. And maybe we could make a book that could get published. And maybe we could make enough music to put out an album. And one day, maybe one day we could make a TV show. We could make enough stuff that could actually fill up a whole TV show. And then over the next number of years, we did all those things. It's been enormously gratifying to see it all happen. And when I say we did all those things, It's not me and Jared, and it's not just me and Jared and the other folks in our company. It's we, meaning this worldwide community of people all over the world collaborating. And so where it could go from here, like I said, I think we've really proven that people like doing this and how it feels to do it, that there's something different about 
collaboration versus just socializing online. And now, right now, what we're focused on is figuring out how to make that, like I said, a lot more accessible to a lot more people. Because what we found as a production company is there's a limit to how many people we can really include in this process. Because as a production company, we were always the ones leading those productions. We would be making a TV show and we would say, all right, come collaborate on our TV show. Or we were making a book and we say, all right, come collaborate on our book. And a lot of people would come and contribute and it was wonderful, but not everybody who contributed was able to actually be in the TV show. And so a lot of those contributors would end up feeling a little left out. And that was something we really wanted to address. It felt like this process that we've got going can be something that's much more inclusive than that, where anybody can have this experience of connecting with other people and collaborating with them and making things together. And in thinking about it, we realized, all right, well, if that's going to happen, then we can't always be the ones leading these projects. We have to make it so that anybody can start their own project, lead their own project. And while we had made gestures towards that in the past, we had never really built tools that made it easy, that made it intuitive where a lot of people were doing it. And that's when we realized, like Jared said, that's when we kind of came to terms with the fact like, okay, we need to acknowledge that the technology is really at the center of this. And we become a tech company. We're not just a production company. And so now we've got this company that our production company is still going strong. We're having, I think, in a lot of ways, our best year ever. But we're building this decentralized platform around the production company. And the composition of our company has changed. Like Jared said, you know, just a year or two ago, almost everyone in our company was part of the production company side of things. And we had a very, very small, awesome, but small team of engineers that built our website and our app. We had no product people. We made our first product hire in 2018. We had zero product people before that. And now it's half our team. We're 40 people and 20 of them are product and tech. And it's been really exciting seeing how when you really invest in that, how big a difference it makes. Once it's easier for people, then you get just a wider and wider variety of perspectives and voices coming into the fray. And so that's what we're really focused on right now is building that technology. And of course, it's not just the technology because the community and the culture and the creative process all has to go hand in hand with the technology. But building out that ecosystem so that we can really make good on a vision that anybody can come and have this experience and be included and find collaborators and find their creative selves through that communal collaboration. It's interesting because it's not necessarily intuitive for people who are running an organization to optimize the experience of being creative to try to include more people. When Joe and I first started the company, Hollywood was like, wait, why would you want to include more people? <laughs> you know, this is like a gated community, you know? Normally organizations are optimizing for quality content. And while we're really proud of the content that we create and we do create quality content, what we also want to do is optimize for the experience of being creative because the more people who have an easier time with the creative process contributing stories voiceover music illustration photography video the more people who are contributing the more different perspectives the more inclusive you can be i don't know of a lot of organizations that are really optimizing for that experience and i think that's created a really rich opportunity for us and that was almost the initial pitch of social media platforms, right? They were democratizing the ability for anyone to get out there and be viewed by the rest of the world. But with the algorithms and what has become of them, it doesn't seem that way. It's just the attention has been put on some of the household names that you hear and some of the smaller fish in the creative process has been lost. And that's why I think hit record and what you have done for your creative process is really in, in stark contrast to what social media has shifted to. The difference also is the social media platforms, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or whatever, I think they have really successfully democratized a part of it. They've democratized the distribution. Like you said, the views. Anybody can now be viewed. And that's great. It's really great. YouTube is amazing. 
my kids right now are really into the entertainer, the piano piece by Scott Joplin. And I can pull up all these different versions of it of people playing it on different pianos or pianos that light up when you play it. Like, it's amazing what you can find on YouTube. I love YouTube, but YouTube doesn't help you actually create the stuff and it doesn't help you find collaborators to make things together. Once you've made something, it helps you distribute it and it helps us viewers have access to this unbelievable library of incredible things that we can watch. But again, I think like the next step, and this isn't to say it's better than YouTube at all. YouTube is unbelievably incredible. It's just, there is a part of the creative process that YouTube doesn't really address. And I think that part's really, really important. And speaking as an artist, and this gets to what Jared was saying about the process, the beauty of the process itself, as opposed to just the value being all in the content. The value isn't just in the content. There's huge value in the doing, in the making. What I love about the career I've been fortunate enough to have as an artist, I've gotten to act in so many different things with so many great people and the joyful moments are not in the finished movie. <laughs> it's not going to the premiere. It's not reading the reviews. It's not any of that stuff. It's when we're making it. That's the best part of the whole thing. It's being on set with the other people, figuring it out, being challenged, being puzzled, being like, how are we gonna do this? I don't know. But then by the end of the day, you figure something out. Like Those are the wonderful, most rich moments that I'm so grateful to have experienced as an artist. And the internet can be a place that allows people to have those moments that provides an environment for that kind of collaboration. But the big platforms today, that's just not what they're built to do. That's not how they make money. It's not the funnel that's really in their interest. So we're just building something else that I think actually runs really nicely and potentially complementary with these other platforms, but it is definitely different. You guys come from the creative side, getting into tech, and it seems like there are more and more people doing this. Aston Kutcher is also actor turned VC, which is kind of interesting. I would love to get your take on the interplay right now between call it the creative or Hollywood side, all media, whether it's music or movies, or maybe even books versus tech. It seems like these are two industries that for a while were insulated from each other. Then Netflix came and Spotify came and it started bleeding through. But there is some kind of a rivalry. There's definitely some conflict in economics. Now that you're on both sides of the fence, what do you think are misunderstandings? What does one side get wrong about the other? That's interesting. I mean, they're really pretty quickly becoming the same industry, aren't they? Mm. And especially in the last few weeks in this darkly historic moment of pandemic, that process is probably accelerating for better or for worse. The big tech companies are the ones who are going to weather this much better than the older media companies that are planted more in older business models. So it seems to me like they're just merging, really. What do the different cultures get wrong about each other? That's a really interesting question. I, I think it's interesting because there's two different, very specific, very different ways of thinking. As an artist, you're making decisions based on your feeling, your instinct. When you are receiving information and you're thinking about it, it's like you have to go by how does this make you feel? What is the audience going to feel? That less tangible thought process leads to your decision making. And those who are from a creative standpoint, when you're just making art, people who are skilled at empathy are able to put themselves into the mindset of making decisions based on feeling can be a really wonderful artist. At the same time, when you're talking about technology companies or technologists, they're looking at data, right? And they're making decisions I don't want to say necessarily purely on data, but the systematic approach is to look at data and make decisions based on that. And that's been a challenge for us. And I think we have a long way to go, Joe and I, in terms of our company, but we've gotten a lot better at saying like, okay, our instinct is to go this way, but the data is not showing that. The data is showing that we should go this way. So we're getting better at doing that. I think on the other hand, from a technology standpoint, sometimes it can lack humanity and sometimes it can lack because you're only going by data. So I think that that has been a push and pull for us. And I think that you could probably see it in 
entertainment companies that are getting into technology and technology companies that are getting into media and entertainment. I think if you look under a layer, you can see the effect of, ah, these people are approaching it from a data analytics standpoint, and these people are looking at it from a less tangible thought process. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, the dichotomy that you're describing. But I would say just the other side of it, I've had wonderful collaborative processes with folks on our team on the product and tech side, and it's certainly informed by data, but really being intuitive and really being empathetic and having to put yourself in the shoes of the members of our community who are using this software and really getting inside their head and inside their psychology and inside their humanity. And there's actually, I find the more I've focused on the product design of our software, the more I've found, wow, there's actually a lot of similarities to this and storytelling. You develop characters even, like they call them use cases, but it's the same as what an actor or a writer does when you're developing characters. And even you name the people, you talk about where they live and what they do for a living and who they are and what their relationships are like. And why they care about creativity and what they're looking for in a community and collaboration. And it's really both sides. And you could also say as much as I think probably Silicon Valley deserves to be made fun of for lacking human empathy, Hollywood deserves to be made fun of for lacking rational thinking. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, that's exactly. <laughs> there's a sweet spot somewhere between art and science, I guess you could say, or between qualitative and quantitative thinking or between data-driven decision-making versus intuition. I think both sides are really valuable and it's always about trying to weigh both ends and find the sweet spot. We're in the middle of the coronavirus outbreak right now. Movie making obviously is a very in-person activity. How is Hollywood... I guess, in movie production handling this, is everyone on a freeze? And maybe separately looking at the movie business itself, especially going to the theater to see the movie business. It was already under some strain prior to this current disaster. Now, you know, no one's going to the movies. Netflix and streaming is additional source of pressure, taking some of the exclusive timing windows. How do you feel about the movie business long term? Is it something that's economically sustainable? The movie business, I mean... What's the movie business? If you're talking about what had its golden era in, frankly, the 1930s, I mean, when you talk about the golden age of Hollywood, people point to 1939 and The Wizard of Oz. And that was when the movies were the preeminent form of culture in the world. And television came along and impacted that greatly, of course. And now more and more media technology will continue to impact that. So media and entertainment as a business, whether you call it movies or whatever, is ever evolving. And the old business model that, again, really did have its heyday in the first half of the 20th century is going to evolve just the way that the theater business has evolved. I would imagine but, revenue and tickets, surely the heydays were probably, I don't know, maybe mid 2000s. Not if you account for inflation. No? no. If you account for inflation, the movie that did the best at box office ever is Gone with the Wind. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Not Transformers, huh? That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. no, because there weren't TVs. So everybody went to the movies. Being at the heart of the creative process and having that bird's eye view, what entertainment formats and what trends are happening right now. We can talk about the turmoil that we're in with coronavirus and everyone being quarantined and maybe some interesting insights you have with everyone being stuck at home and what they're using hit record for, but also just longer term. Is it podcasting? Is it gaming? What's really exciting you guys now? I would go back to hit record. Hit record is a bizarre silver lining to this really dark moment that is a real struggle that a lot of people are suffering through. But to see our community kind of rise to the occasion and see this thing that we've been working on for all this time provide for a need that people are having. I think nowadays with more time at home, but I should take a pause to say not everybody can afford to stay at home. And there's the frontline workers that deserve all the respect and gratitude in the world healthcare and food and the essential workers. And then there's also a lot of people who can't afford, they don't have a job that they can work at home and they can't afford to quit their job. And not everybody's staying at home. We're actually making a documentary about that exact thing on here before right now. But obviously a lot of people are at home and quarantined. And I think people are looking for something a bit more meaningful or substantial than the kind of disposable stuff that some of the big social media platforms are optimized for. I think, again, being creative together with other people that provides a substance that's really different than just consuming stuff or even just putting out your own stuff and seeing what reaction you get. 
from your own stuff. Collaborating with other people is really different. And so we're seeing a real surge of people coming and participating. And like I say, I wish it were under better circumstances, of course, but it feels good to be filling a need that this dark time has brought forward. Broadening the scope out a little even wider, I think, and it's speaking to what Joe is talking about. People are wanting human connection. They're not able to connect with people IRL. What are those comps? Obviously, Zoom. People are connecting on through creativity on hit record. But I had this idea. I was like, oh, man, I'm going to get real tired of just binge watching Netflix shows. The day that everybody was like stockpiling at supermarkets, I went to GameStop because I wanted to be able to connect and engage in video games and connecting with other people in that way because... I live alone. So it's like, I'm going to wanting that human connection. So it's interesting to see the new kinds of ways that people can connect and engage that don't feel as transactional as a like, as a comment, but like a real meaningful connection virtually are the things that are interesting to us right now, especially. I have one more question and this is a bit specific, but I have to ask one of the newest platforms out there, media platforms being TikTok, it's gone absolutely wild in terms of popularity. It's grown globally. Everyone's using it. It seems to have a bit of a different angle. Do you have an opinion on it? And if so, like, is there something different that led to TikTok's success in your opinion? Or is there anything negative that we should be on the lookout for when we look at a platform like this? The time I've spent on TikTok, I've really enjoyed it. It feels like it's got an overall more positive and creative feeling than I get other places. The simple ability to add music to a video. You know, the story of TikTok Mm -hmm. is Musical.ly. Musical.ly was an American company, which was completely just copied, from my understanding of it, pixel for pixel by another company and then called TikTok. And then that got so big in China that they were able to acquire Musical.ly. I did not know that was the story at all. I think that's what happened. I'm not looking at a source right now, so I don't want to claim authority here, but I'm pretty sure... There's another parallel. I mean, this one I know is in fact true. Groupon is Uh an American company. It was copied by a thousand Chinese companies, not one, by a thousand. There was a thousand Groupons in China. One of them is called Meituan, and now they are 100 times bigger than Groupon, if not a thousand. Yeah, Yeah. so that's worth noting. (laughs) Uh, But I think it's really fun to be able to post videos and add music. It's so simple, and it's so effective. And if you've ever watched a movie without the music, like if you watch it with the dialogue, but without music in the edit room or whatever, music adds so much. And so I totally get why the ability to add music was a key, key thing that made a video platform like that really blow up. They monetize with the same ad business model as Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. And as I spoke about a minute ago, I think that business model inherently leads to some bad outcomes. And I'm certainly not the only one saying this. If you read what Jaron Lanier has to say, or what Tristan Harris has to say, or what lots of other people have to say about that kind of attention economy ad model, I think there's real problems with it. And TikTok runs on the same exact model. But creatively, I got to say, I haven't made a TikTok account. I haven't spent the time. But the time that I have spent just looking at the stuff gives me a nicer feeling than I get looking at some other social media Mm -hmm. places. Yeah, it does seem to be more friendly, so to speak. (laughs) Yeah, and that's great. I'm all for it. Yeah. (laughs) All for it. It's inspiring like kids to dance and stuff. That's great. (laughs) And for my own use, you know, I'm doing very small projects, but the tools that it allows you to use to build out these videos and pair with music, comparing it to an Instagram or Facebook, it's light years ahead of what they're giving you to build on versus what TikTok gives you. The editing software that's just built right into the app, it seems years more advanced than Instagram and Snapchat. It just goes to show like technology and creativity have always been intrinsically connected. You know, one of the things that reminds me of that I find fascinating is when writing started, it was a newfangled technology and words were an oral thing. And they say that Socrates, back in ancient Greece, Socrates never wrote. You can only read about Socrates. Plato wrote about Socrates. Socrates didn't write. And Socrates was against writing. He was against the written word. He was like, this is going to be bad for how we think. 
It's going to like cage our thought process to put things down in letters and words. Words are meant to be spoken, not written on a page. And to a degree, he's right. And to a degree, he's wrong. There is something that writing does that probably changed words and thoughts that we'll never get back. But of course, there's also something very beautiful about writing. And nowadays, it's so old, we don't think of the written word as a technology. But it is. It, it was. And I think the same goes for all kinds of new technologies. And there's going to be good sides and there's going to be bad sides to all kinds of technologies. And they're going to have impacts on how we as human beings express ourselves. So it's up to us to just, I think, be thoughtful about how those technologies are impacting our creative processes and how we can make sure that those technologies work in our favor instead of work against us. That's awesome. I'll ask a fun question just to wrap it up. Joe, you've been in a lot of movies, way more than I thought. Which movie <laughs> in this time of lockdowns and coronavirus that you've been in that no one has ever heard of should they watch at home? <laughs> a movie that I've been in that people haven't heard of that they should watch at home? Your favorite, but you think that's underrated. How about Hesher? Watch Hesher. Not that many people have seen that one. It's a little movie about death, <laughs> but it's kind of fun and weird. <laughs> Is it about death? Well, yeah, it's about a 10-year-old boy whose mom dies, and then this kind of weird, fucked up, heavy metal Mary Poppins specter comes to live with the family in a weird way. I um, forgot that that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I only saw it once. I really like that movie and uh, it's like a little Sundance movie. So Natalie Portman is in it. Rain Wilson is in it. It's great. That's true. Also, if you haven't seen Brick is an incredible movie. Ryan Johnson's first movie. Well, first feature length movie, I suppose, of Star Wars and Knives Out and Looper fame. But Brick, was it yesterday or two days ago? It was like some sort of anniversary of Brick, right? Oh, yeah. Brick came out. 2004? Three? Yeah. Anyway. It's a... Uh, unbelievable, really great movie. I'll ask one more final fun question. What is one project on Hit Record going on right now that's super exciting to watch and if you're contributing at all? Well, I actually just mentioned there's this documentary project that I'm co-leading with a woman on Hit Record, a woman named Vicky who goes by Vicious Vixen. It started with this piece of writing from her. She found out that there were confirmed cases of COVID-19 in her workplace. And then she was obviously very upset about that. And she has a job and can't stay home and can't afford to quit her job. And she was just really feeling anxious and upset about the fact that her economic reality was putting her at greater risk. And she was feeling like, you know, the whole world is telling me stay at home, everyone stay at home, but I can't stay home. And it doesn't feel good to get your advice. Most of the people giving that advice are enjoying a luxury to get to stay home. And I found her writing so impactful. I was like, fuck, that's me. Like, that's so exactly right. I've said that exact thing just recently. I've said, everyone stay home and really not taking the time to think about how lucky I am to even have that opportunity. And so she and I are leading a documentary project and, and uh, people are coming to site and talking on camera about their experience, whether they are getting to stay home or they're not getting to stay home. And we've had both. And we just launched the project yesterday, actually. And so it's a great time to come contribute. And people are also shooting video footage of either themselves at home or themselves out in the world, if that's their life. People are writing about it and making art about it. I made a weird song about it that people are lip syncing to. And I want to put it together into some kind of artful documentary piece. Um, but it's the kind of thing that anybody can contribute to because either you are staying home or you're not. And everybody's perspective, I think, is interesting. And we want to try to compare the two. And ultimately, I think it says a lot about economic inequality in our world that how much money you have is determining whether or not you're able to do everything you can to stay safe from this pandemic. It's really not the way the world should work. Hopefully, this kind of conversation can bring that to light to some degree or another. But that's a project I'm really excited about right now. Jared, do you have one? I think what Joe said is right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the power of the platform is like Joe said, it was like, hey, that was me. But to hear the perspective of somebody who's not in that position, when you make the opportunity such that anybody can feel like they can participate, whether the technology is there or the creative prompt is there that inspires them to participate, you just get a lot of different perspectives that you wouldn't have necessarily even thought about. 
those kinds of surprises or unexpected storytelling is what really motivates us and really inspires us to make the best product and organization platform for everybody. Awesome. All right. Well, Joe, Jared, thank you for coming on. This has been great. Thanks so much. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.